always my biggest get on Corrin's world. <laughs> Welcome back is Kyle. Um, thank you for coming back on the channel, man. I appreciate it always. How weird does it feel with you're the one that talks first? Because it we're feels so super weird. Starting. It's so weird. The first time I like did a, a chat with you, uh, and I said it before, I was like, I was beyond nervous because it's like I talk to you every single day. So like asking you some shit or like just talking to you is just normal. So having to sit down and like think of maybe some questions that you'd like answer that I haven't asked you about or stuff about your channel that like. That, like I obviously care about your channel, but I think like people outside listening care about it more than like I do maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So having to think of questions that like maybe they would want to hear was like tough for me to do because you're my boy and I feel like I could have just texted you the question instead of like having to sit down and talk to you about it. Yeah, it felt like the format was more forced than what you're used to. 100%. When we do Kyle and Corn, we're just going. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So and, to have it like laid out like oh, I'm going to ask you this, 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 this. It's a little bit like formulaic yeah so and that's yeah, how yeah. this is going to be because um i was specifically interested in obviously your your now viral video of uh of the bernie sanders um interview you did um which is just amazing to me because like people have known we've been friends since middle school and your channel has grown to like great lengths and it almost put like a validation on your channel like the fact that you are now you know presidentially validated by interviewing bernie sanders so uh, i like genuinely want to know and i'm sure a lot of people know how did that even come about and like um just talk about your i mean obviously your knowledge of bernie sanders but how did that whole thing like facilitate itself well first of all i just want to tell you that you were one of the first two people to know about it thanks man <laughs> maybe the first actually because i needed you to do a little test yeah in terms of technological stuff so you so you hooked me up and you helped me out with that but um, yeah, it, it's actually kind of. There's a really funny backstory to it because it's not. I I didn't ask. I didn't ask. I think that's the biggest like thing, the most important thing to people. Because I was reading through the comments mm -hmm. on the Bernie video, and it's so funny because everybody's like, "Oh my god, Kyle looks so nervous. Oh my god, look at that big ass cheese on his face," and everybody's like thinking like this is something that I've been you know, whatever, working behind the scenes to try to do for a hot minute. But yeah. I didn't even ask. I didn't ask. What that, happened was I know somebody um, at the Bernie campaign, high up in the Bernie campaign, and I think that at some point within the past week or two, there was an actual decision made at a high level in the Bernie campaign that they're going to try to embrace new media because they know that old media is totally biased against them and they do not give them fair coverage mm -hmm. and they will not give them fair coverage. Mm -hmm. And so I think somebody at the, you know, the top of that campaign is smart enough to know that, well, hold on now, there's this whole other medium in the same way that like, like conservatives do, uh, you know, like they'll maybe go to talk radio and go to Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and stuff like that. Like they have their own alternative media network. And I don't think like actual lefty politicians have thought about this much, except maybe Tulsi Gabbard and Ro Khanna that like there's this whole other media infrastructure out there that's new media mm -hmm. and there are so many sympathetic voices to bernie's message yep. to new media so i think they made a decision like we're gonna try to hit like a whole bunch of new media because the same day they did my show it, they did tyt okay and they did uh katie halper and matt taibbi's new podcast for rolling stone like they hit a bunch of new media on the same day and i so it was definitely a decision but what happened was the person I know at the Bernie campaign reached out to me and basically flat out told me, like, you're good to, to go tomorrow at like 1030. <laughs> and I was like, what What are you talking about? <laughs> and he was like, to interview Bernie. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, I was like taking a little bit, of, uh, you know, back by it. And I was like, I don't. So my, my actually my initial reaction was like, that's not even necessary because, number one, I don't really do interviews. Yeah. OK. But number two. I'm already like his biggest cheerleader anyway. And know? it was the, it was going to be the day after the debate too. So I mean like you have your show prep and you are going to have breakdown prep. So it's almost gangster in a way that you were just like uh, you're sort of throwing a wrench in my shit here. That's exactly my that that was exactly my thoughts because I had this whole big debate show prepped and I was like this is going to it's, it's going to be a long show. I got a whole bunch of clips. I got to get my debate breakdown. So I was working until like three o'clock in the morning that night. Damn. You know, and then, but what am I going to do? Like, all it took was, I, at first I was like, nah, it's not really necessary, yada, yada. 
it just took like this much pushing for me to be like all right fine let's do this and also and like you don't i mean you don't want to like he's we respect him we like him as a politician and, and like we want to help his campaign well, we you want to help his campaign so it's almost just like you you're as much as people think like oh bernie sanders went on kyle's show it's like no like you're sort of doing him a service too by putting him on your platform <laughs> i don't know if i'd say that for real though you could tell that bernie like i don't before he went on joe rogan's show and before he went on my show it's a majority chance that he didn't know who either joe rogan was or i was because he's just not in that world mm -hmm. you know what i mean um, yeah, but that's that's also an interesting point too, is because like he might have known you from facilitating that meetup, you know. So like he might have done a little I bit of research. You don't, I don't think, think so? Knew that. No, I think that the person who I know at Bernie's campaign, who I said it like the when I set that up, I don't think that reached Bernie that they were like, hey man, here's the guy who set up your talk with Joe Rogan. I don't think that that got to him. Um, but there was something else that I wanted to mention that just went out of my head. That it was what we were talking about. I was up. Oh, oh. So the questions, um, it's weird how the questions came to me. So at first when I was like, it's not really necessary for me to talk to him, yada, yada. Right after I said that, it was almost like from the sky fell all of these questions that I, I wanted to ask him. And so they just kept hitting me like one, two, three, four. It was weird. It was like one after the other, after the other, after the other. And then like all of a sudden, next thing I know, I look down at a sheet of paper. I'm jotting these questions down. I got like 10 questions there that are really good questions that I haven't heard anybody ask him and the questions I really want to know the answer to. And so that's when I was like, okay, I got, I got to talk to him because there's so much I want to ask him. And, that, and that's what I wanted to ask you is almost just like, so you obviously, we watch the debates. We get very frustrated as like political people that are interested in like who our next president's going to be. And we get fed up with CNN and all these ABCs who do the debates because they're not asking real questions and the stories that they cover are all just hollywood like tmz attention grabbing headlines because they all want eyeballs because they're all competing against each other whereas new media like you and other people um actually talk about real substance so like how did you even like decide because you knew it was a short amount of time that you had to speak with him how did you filter down those questions and like figure out what was the most important things you were going to ask him so this is what happened. They all came to me. The questions came one after the other, after the other, after the other. And then I looked at the paper afterwards and I was like, okay, let me look through this. What do I definitely need answered? What's like, I kind of need it answered. And what's like, this is just something I want to know, but it's not as important. And then I just kind of structured it according to that. And what's interesting is, again, if you read the comments of that video, most people recognize that I was actually asking really good questions. Yeah. But there's a few that you could tell they only listened to the first question and then they commented and that they were like, like, well, oh, here he is asking like really easy questions. And it's like, actually, no, I asked him some very difficult questions. And on one or two of them, he didn't give the best answer. He gave really good answers for most of them. But there was one like when I said, and this should have been, he could have knocked this out of the park when I was like, will you end the Iraq and Afghanistan wars within the first hundred days? And his reaction was like, I don't know if we could do it in the first hundred days. Yeah, I respected that answer, though. I didn't. Oh, really? I didn't. And that's where it's one of that's one of those issues where if I had more time, mm -hmm. my follow up would have immediately been, "We've already been there for eighteen years. Should you get them out in the first week?" <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point too. I mean, yeah. yeah, like so. So there were some things where I was like, and, and that's the thing, guys, is so since I knew I only had, I said, "How much time do I have?" The person says ten minutes. Damn, and you originally thought I think more than that, right? Because when you had told me, you were like, "I might have a half an hour or something like that." So then when they said 10 minutes, I'm like, yeah, oh, this is insane because there's like, that, I'm going to give a real interview. I'm not going to give a bullshit interview. And then that and gets so, filtered down to like the sound buddy stuff that like happens at the debates where it's like, how can he answer a substantive question in a half a second? And so I had I had a choice to make because I could have and Humanist Report pointed this out to me too. shout out to Mike. He was like. I don't know how, because he, he said I could have spent the whole time on one question. Mm -hmm. And in my head, I'm like, oh, well, I could have easily too. So I had to make a decision at the beginning of the interview that I wanted as many questions answered as possible. So I got, you know, I clipped it out. I got like seven solid questions in, in that tiny time frame. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, it worked out. But imagine what I could have done with 30 minutes. If I had 30 minutes, I would have given the best, the best possible interview to him because yeah. – so I let and, and here's here's another thing that answers your question. 
I led with that first question because I wanted him to understand that, like, I support you and you're my preferred candidate. And I, here's a question that is not really all that difficult. I'm just curious in your opinion as to why so many Democrats in the party, like, don't buy into your worldview. So I started out with, like, a semi-easy one. Yep. And then I started pouring on, like, really specific questions that were a little bit more difficult that you know and there were again i did a separate segment um and i you know i released it right after the bernie interview where mm-hmm. i said here are the questions that i wanted to ask that i wasn't able to get to because there were still like a few that were really like i would have prioritized very highly like they would have been the next one out of my mouth like for example pardoning edward snowden julian assange and chelsea manning that was like the next one that I wanted to ask. There were a few of those that it was like, oh, I want to ask this one, but I had to prioritize it the last minute. When, when he, Remember when he said in the interview, he's like, I think we could maybe take uh, one more question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what did I do? Hit I him said, with... all right, we're going to go to our lightning round. Yep, yeah, and that was, that was genius. Trying, trying to squeeze in like three or four real quick. Like yep. just say yes, no, or maybe to these. Yeah. I said body cameras on lobbyists. I said ranked choice voting. I still had like four more things written down there. But I had to just skip to the last shit. But I respect him so. I respect him so much too, because even in that, he was like, you know, I don't really like one-word answers, you know, and like he even took time, and you got a little bit more out of him, it seemed like, because he had to break those lightning down questions a little bit more, you know. Yeah, but I feel like the reason I said yes, no, or maybe is Mm -hmm. because I was trying to leave him the wiggle room where he could just say maybe to something, and I could move on and squeeze more in. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like for the body cameras on lobbyists, when I listen back to the interview and I hear his answer on that. The first thing I thought was, you could have just said maybe, mm-hmm. because his thing was like, oh, I believe in full transparency, I'm very strongly against lobbyists, and we're going to try to bring about transparency however possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, that's what he said, and I'm like, that's a maybe. You could have just said maybe to body cameras on lobbyists, and then I would have been able to squeeze in one or two more like things that you could have answered. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, one thing I think you did really well, which, again, a lot of these debates don't do a good job of, is they frame the question as, like, it's always like a conservative, um, like, argument, which is usually just out of left field, which is just, like, dumb or just, like, it just makes no sense. Yeah, how are you so, going to pay for it? That's always the question. For yeah. How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? Exactly. Like, something so absurd that you, like, you have to take the first part of your answer and almost just bring validity to that question by trying to, like, answer that. And then you can sort of, like, speak on your talking point of, like, here's the actual problem and blah, 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 when everybody just maybe will take a soundbite from that first half, which is just answering the nonsense question. Like, something you did an awesome job of is, like, you came at him with, like, I agree with you maybe on this or something like that. Now, how would how would you do this? And, like, they are more genuine in answering those questions because they understand where you're coming from as of ju- as opposed to just, like, well, that makes no sense. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like how there were a few answers that he did really well, in my opinion, when he started with absolutely. Because I thought those questions were harder than his what he made it out like they were. Mm-hmm. Because one, one of the questions that he answered absolutely to, I said, um, will, you know, will you use executive orders wherever constitutionally possible to advance your agenda? And that's honestly one that, like— There was a chance he would have been like, well, we'll have to look at it issue by issue type thing. But he was just like, oh, absolutely. Like wherever I could sign an executive order that's going to that's going to help fix something. I'm down. I'm going to do that. Yeah. And that's one of those things where it's like there's a reason I asked that question, because that's a really important power that the president has. And oftentimes left wing presidents don't utilize it Mm -hmm. like Obama didn't do really good executive orders until the later part of his second term. So that's why I kind of threw that out there, because there's a chance that Bernie might not do any, you know, much with the executive orders because the media is going to fire back like he's some sort of dictator or something if he does that. Yeah. But it made me happy that he answered absolutely because it showed that like he actually he was on the level that I wanted him to be at on that answer. Yeah. It shows me that he was almost like this is such a silly question, which is a good thing because that shows that he's on, he agrees with me on that. Where I think in my own mind, if I'm president, of course, give me give me my pen and I'm signing executive orders left and right. Um, and then the other thing was. Oh, primary in corporate Democrats. See, that's one where I'm like, I don't. There's a chance he he might not be like absolutely. There's a chance he might be like, well, I'll have to look at uh, on a case by case basis who's running, and then maybe maybe not. I have a lot of friends in the Democratic Party, even though they might not agree with me, yada yada. But he was like, well, absolutely, no, we're gonna do everything we can to get Medicare for all passed. If that includes primary and corporate Democrats, I'll be there. I'll yeah. campaign against them. 
Yeah, I mean, his yeah, his biggest push now. A lot of the stuff you're seeing is like, tell me, you know, uh, um, a medical bill or something that you had to pay for that's just been absurd. And some of the stories you're seeing is just like, I read one today that a lady lost her child three hours into it and got charged six hundred dollars like bill or something like that. It, like it, the way she phrased it was, it was like mind boggling. But basically, she paid six hundred dollars to lose her son or daughter in three hours. And like Bernie's bringing attention to this stuff and something that you tweeted out the other day is just like Beto gets all this coverage because he throws a couple curse words in his answers and like, <laughs> you know, and it's like no one's really covering Bernie's shit. Like they covered the glorified story of the guy who said he was going to commit suicide, which is so sad. But it's just like they go to these like glamorous stories, you know, and it's just like there's actual stories being written on his Twitter account that they're not covering. Yeah, and just so everybody knows, and I try to explain this on my show too, the problem is not that Beto curses. The problem is that that's not his personality, that's not who he is, but he's doing it on purpose to try to get attention as a like a trick, Yeah. you know? Like, if that fits your personality, I'm not going to critique you for it. I'm me. I curse more than anybody. So obviously my problem is not with cursing. My problem is that it's like a concerted effort and a strategy to try to, like, like, let me try to get more, like, cheap coverage, basically, yeah. without actually supporting things that make sense. Yeah, and it's sad because, I mean, he's changed up his, like, stance on so many different things, like, throwing so much shit at the wall. Relaunched his campaign, like, three times. He was like, oh, we're relaunching now because, you know, our campaign kind of stalled out. It's like, yeah, no matter how many times you relaunch it, it's going to do bad because you suck. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Something that, like, I mean, him relaunching his campaign is just a joke and something that Bernie has never did and never wavered on is just like his policy on tons of things, you know? And like he almost to his discredit, like lost his voice and hurt him a little bit in the debate. Cause his voice was so hoarse. And he even mentioned in the chat, like I do too many, I do too many uh, debates or whatever like that. Like how did, did it ever like even come across your mind when he was answering a question? Like, Oh, his voice doesn't sound good. Like I, I don't uh, like, I, I can't rock with him on that. Answer, on that answer. No, because so I know that his voice was, you know, hoarse, but it was hoarse the night before at the debate. Yeah. So, like, it's just it is what it is, you know, and some people have criticized him for that very heavily. The thing about that criticism that I think is ridiculous is it's always framed as, oh, man, his voice is hoarse. Won't other people look at this and be like, that's a bad thing? So, in other words, stop and think about that criticism for a second. That criticism is not, hey, I'm against this. I can't believe he's doing this. The criticism is always framed as like, what if other people hear that and go, oh my God, that's so bad. But everybody's saying that. Everybody is saying, oh my God, what if other people don't like this? But if everybody's saying that, then that means nobody's really bothered by it and everybody's yeah. just afraid other people are bothered by it. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's obvious. He's been doing rallies. He's been doing whatever, town halls. He's trying to save the country. So, you know, dude hasn't taken many days off, but he did recently. He's, he... They canceled three events in South Carolina just to take a little bit off, rest his voice a little bit. But, yeah, I mean, that's par for the course, man. This is going to happen. Campaigning is the hardest thing in the world, man. And, yeah. Warren, you know better than anybody because you travel a lot. Yeah. Like, think, imagine if you were traveling, like, double the amount that you're already traveling, and then everywhere you go, you got to stop and give speeches to stadiums full of 10,000 people. And outside of the speeches, like, even when he gets off of stage, like, he's still, like, a, like all, all these candidates, they're, like, celebrities. So it's, like, in the airport. and They're always on. They're, yeah, they're always, always on. on. You know, like, checking into a hotel, like, the person behind the counter knows you. Maybe they want a selfie or something like that. Like, you can never just be like, nah, man. Because that one nah man turns into like TMZ covering that or that like someone going on CNN and saying, hey, I had a bad experience with Bernie Sanders. Like and and people don't take that into like their consideration when they're looking at a candidate is just like you never hear any of these stories of like a Bernie Sanders or to other candidates credits, too. You don't really hear many stories of like I was turned down for a photo or, you know, bad stuff. But like. It's so impressive to me about Bernie Sanders is like when you told me you were going to have an interview with him, one, I was like blown away. And two, I was almost just like, damn, man, like it's so impressive that he doesn't stop because like he really cares about this shit. Like he just finished the yeah. debate and now he's going on like new media and, and talking about it more to reach a new audience. Like it, it's just it's it's impressive, man. Like, yeah, no, it, it really is impressive. I don't I can't even tell you how many people have told me. Like, man, I would give that dude two years off my life in a second. Yeah. You know? And, and here's something that, like, is even more fascinating. You know, like, 
someone like a, um, a Hillary Clinton or like Elizabeth Warren, and again, I, I don't follow them as much as I do Bernie because I, I am a Bernie supporter and I like him. Um, but like he'll go on and do your show. And I was watching Ellen and there's like this young news reporter kid who reaches out to candidates and like he did one with I think like Elizabeth Warren and it went viral. And it's like, yes, Elizabeth Warren is going to say yes to like an 11 year old kid because that's what will make Ellen and that's what will go viral. And, you know, this kid will one day become president or something, maybe. But like Bernie doesn't give a shit about that stuff. Like he's actually talking to people with an audience who can vote, you know, and it's, it's not never, it's never gimmicky. Exactly. It's yes. never gimmicky. Yeah. It's always like serious. Yep. Like I'm a politician. I have a very serious job where I try to make laws and like govern our society. Mm-hmm. And I take that job very seriously. And I'm going to try to tell everybody exactly what I'm in favor of, exactly what my views are, so on and so forth. Whereas, yeah, you get the sense with pretty much all the other candidates. It's just so gimmicky. Yeah. It's like, how can I get my name in the news in a cheap and positive way very quickly? Yeah. It's like, it, you know, it's so arbitrary and it's so fickle because you can get a positive round of, of news coverage from mainstream media by doing something stupid like you just said. Like, oh, I spoke to an 11-year-old or whatever. Like, I had an interview with an 11-year-old. But there, then there's Bernie who's going around the country and actually, like, talking to people at rallies and they're telling him about their medical debt and all their problems. He's stopping somebody from committing suicide, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah. And, like, usually 85 to 90 percent of the time, they're not giving him positive coverage for doing actual positive stuff. Yeah. So it's all that's I think that's why new media is so important. And that's why you got to have this alternative network, which, you know, allows it gives people a real outlet to talk about real things as opposed to like the stupid filter that you get when you turn on CNN or, or MSNBC or whoever. Yeah. And and I remember sh- like straight back when like Beto was running in Texas against Ted Cruz and like it might have been like Beyonce or something tweeted out for him. And like he he glorified that and, you know, sort of maybe I think he tweeted back to her. But like. Cardi B comes out and supports Bernie Sanders and he's like, all right, cool. Like, let's sit down and actually talk about shit that applies to you and like, you know, Hispanic girls like you and like people from poverty in your situation. And it's not just like a tweet back to her like, oh, can I see them cheeks or something like that? Like, it's like (laughs) (laughs) imagine that's what Beto said to Beyonce or whoever. (laughs) He's like, yo, like it was good with Jay. Does he care? Like. (laughs) But but I like that he actually sits down with people of like, you know, uh, um, that have these platforms and actually talks about substance rather than just like, um, you know, getting into like a Twitter conversation with them. Yeah, Um, I had no idea Cardi B was uh, was Hispanic. Yeah, I think she's or is is she black? I thought she was black. Oh, maybe. I don't know. I thought she was like, I'm looking this up. Yeah, yeah, check that. Um, (laughs) Where a lot of times, like, presidential candidates will have, you know, like, a lot of filters around them, and you can't actually get, like, a raw answer. Any Were there any, like, stipulations going into the chat, like, hey, don't ask Bernie about this, or, like... No, it, none at all. None whatsoever. And that's awesome to hear, just because, like, a lot of times people will say, like, you know, don't talk about this, don't talk about that, and that's when you don't actually see a genuine, real person. Yeah, it's all, all I got was just the time thing. Yeah. I was first told 10 minutes, and I was told I can go a little bit over 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. By the way, I just looked it up now. You're right. Is she? Her name is definitely... And she was born in 1992? Yeah, she's young. She's from... I think she's from, um, like, the Bronx or something like that. Her name is Belcalis Marlenis Almanzar. Damn. So, it, what does it say what her nationality is? Is she Dominican? I'm, I'm looking for that right now. All I see is her name. It says nationality American. I'm looking for background, though. Oh, Dominican. Okay, good. Oh, Dominican father and Trinidadian and Spanish mother. Okay. Okay, so, so she makes. Yeah, Trinidad is, is, I thought, she's from the island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you asked Bernie, one of my favorite questions was Jordan versus LeBron. And he answered LeBron because of his, like, philanthropy stuff and, like, all the off-the-court stuff he does. Is LeBron a supporter of Bernie? Or, like, did, did he, um, do you know if he came out and supported him? No, I know that in 2016 he came out for Hillary, but if I'm not mistaken, he came out like when the primary was kind of already over. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong about that, guys. Fact check me on that. But I I vaguely remember it was like really late in the process. And then he was like, I'm with her or something behind Hillary. I think it was when it was already Hillary versus Trump, Mm -hmm. because I remember like a rally in Ohio and he went to it or something like that. Okay, yeah, I think I remember Um, that. But what happened was LeBron James came out in support of this really important bill in California, this bill to pay college athletes, 
which is really important because if you 100%. think about it, they're just getting robbed. Like yep. You have these people who are massive revenue generators playing basketball. Coaches are making are millions like, of dollars. Nah, nah, we're going to keep all that because this, you know, we got to keep the system pure, and this is like education and whatnot. So just play for free and shut the fuck up. Such a and joke. It's like, oh my god, you guys are like basically, you know, you have indentured servants by making these people play basketball, and you don't pay them. It's kind of insane. Yep. Because not all of them are going to go on to the NBA. So many of them are not going to go on to the NBA, and they could have gotten compensated while they were a college. It's just, it's crazy. So anyway. And they can't even make money on their own. So if one was like a trumpet player, and he had a YouTube channel of him playing trumpet, he couldn't profit off that channel See, if he that's played. Insane. Yeah. That's just beyond insane. Yeah. So anyway, um, LeBron came out in support of that bill, which pays them, and then Bernie tweeted support of LeBron supporting that bill and came out in support of that same bill. And so I think that them, like, basically both, and both of those things made headlines, by the way, LeBron and Bernie coming out for that bill. And okay. that bill passed overwhelmingly in California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, So that's that. really awesome. So anyway, this, uh, when I asked Bernie that question, it was kind of like four days after that story came out. And so that's why I threw in there is because of the policy he supported with you. And he said, well, listen, he's w been willing to get involved in political issues, and I respect that because, you know, Jordan is actually the perfect example of a dude who stayed out on purpose and was like, yeah, he he famously said Republicans buy sneakers, too, when he was asked why he doesn't come out in, in support of certain political issues. And, you know, I, I get it. I get it. You know, I can't hate because my fucking, you know, idol Tiger Woods does the same thing that Jordan does. So, yeah. like, I get it. And everybody's going to say, yeah, but Tiger played golf with uh, Trump. He also played golf with Obama. Mm -hmm. So, like, he purposely keeps it like. Tee -hee -hee, you don't know I'm apolitical yeah. but I think that Bernie just respects massively the fact that LeBron James has w been willing to stick his neck out there and say like no this is what I think on this issue and this issue and this issue and I'm not just like Laura Ingram famously said like shut up and dribble Yeah. I think that was to LeBron but it may have been to yeah, somebody it was. else it was to LeBron mm -hmm. yeah and so you know like LeBron took that and like flipped it back on her and like wore a shirt or something that yeah. said like shut up and dribble or yeah. not just a basketball player it was something more like than that. an athlete I think is like his like his like his catchphrase yeah, so, like, anyway, I respect LeBron, he respects LeBron for that reason, and so, but yeah, I, by the way, I had so many other of those, like, well, no, I only had two other of those, like, end of the interview type tag on shits that I was going to ask, and one of them was uh, Instinct versus Backstreet Boys. <laughs> oh, man. And, I wanted so bad, dude, I wanted to ask him that. Yeah, that would have been, that would have been epic, just because one thing I told you when he interviewed with Rogan was, like, I, I liked the conversation the most when they were talking about, like, the UFOs, and they were talking about, like, Bernie smoking weed or whatever because like you take the filter off everything it's a question you've never heard asked to him before and like it's something we all care about like we all want to know who's better in sync or Backstreet Boys and like he lived through that error and it's like these, I'm saying these are the the age old debates man yeah, Jordan yeah, yeah. versus LeBron in sync versus Backstreet Boys and there was one other that I'm blanking on what was I'm it Biggie at. Tupac it was Biggie Tupac there yeah you yeah, yeah I remember you said that I, I would have loved to get that answer on that because here's the thing. I like there's a good chance that Bernie only vaguely knows who NSYNC and Backstreet Boys are and yeah. Biggie and Tupac are, but I would I would have made him answer it. I would have been like, yeah. then just pick one by the sound of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, was there any point? And you've been doing your show for a while, and you've spoken to a lot of people. Like, one, do you get any type of nerves or nervousness? And then, was there any moment while you're interviewing him that you're like in your head, like, holy fuck, man, I'm interviewing Bernie Sanders right now. Well, again, it's funny because when I was reading through the comments, there was such a disconnect between how they were perceiving it mm -hmm. and what was really going on in my head. Because it's not like the reason the only reason I'm like relatively successful at having my YouTube channel is because I feel most comfortable when I'm on my YouTube channel. Yeah. And when I'm doing my show and when I'm talking publicly, I've said this before. You've heard me say this before. I'm more comfortable talking to 200 people in a room giving a speech than I am talking one on one to somebody. And yeah. I don't know what that is. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know if it's natural uh, in, in the sense I was born that way. I don't know if it's something that I picked up later on. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because I'm socially awkward in an interpersonal kind of way. I don't usually. think so. But not to you because you're one of my best friends. So obviously you like you know me in a super close way. So yeah. it's a little different. Um, but I, yeah, no, I wasn't nervous at all or anything like that. I was. I mean, I was happy he was doing it, of course. Yeah. Because, and that smile that everybody was referencing was real. Like I was very happy I was talking to him. But no, at no point was I nervous. At no point, you know, did I – my brain sputter out or something and I couldn't get a question out. At no point did I not comprehend what he was saying. I'm mm -hmm. most comfortable in that kind of scenario where I'm doing an interview for the YouTube channel or I'm just talking on the YouTube channel or whatever it might be. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And, and like, I, I don't, like – 
ever feel this way but like you know sometimes like when i did the bernie video like it, it got more views than i thought and then like i start to like dissect that afterwards and i'm like wow like five thousand people saw that video that's incredible you know like i i look at it and it's just like damn man like i don't know if he realizes it, but like every answer bernie's giving like someone's listening to that and that could change somebody's vote you know which is like super impactful and you could tell in the questions that you asked that there was substance to it and like i'm sure you take all that into account when you're thinking of the questions too you know yeah and it's true especially when you're at his level and when you're campaigning for president people are going to hang on your words especially when people are looking for real solutions mm -hmm. and that's who's attracted to his campaign that's why that dude who was about to kill himself yeah went to a bernie sanders town hall he was looking for hope. He was looking for somebody give me something I can cling to right now mm -hmm. because I'm going to kill myself. I have $100,000 in medical debt. I can't pay for it, and I have a chronic illness that's take, slowly killing me. So it was it, people like that. They're, they're hanging on his every word because he's giving people hope. He's giving people a better future, and he's not like nihilistic in the sense that he's like, what are we going to do? This is just how it is. And you get the sense that so many of the Democratic candidates, that's their position. Their position is like, well, maybe we can make it like a little bit better around the edges, but to really redo stuff and radically change stuff, like, come on, don't be crazy. Yeah. And so how would you say, like, how could, like, so I'm pretty set in my ways that I like Bernie Sanders. I've, like, just been a fan of his for a while. How can I, like, educate myself? Like, what if there was a Republican out there that, like, I was interested in or something like that? Like, I know there's not, but, like, I sort of just tune them out. Like, how can someone find that Bernie chat and listen to it and be like, okay, that guy's making sense, you know, like just giving yeah. everybody a chance type of deal. I mean, it's tough because unless you're a news junkie and like you follow like my Twitter is like 80 percent just news from yeah. all different outlets. So unless you're a Twitter junkie and you're a, or a news junkie, I mean, and you're actively searching it out, then that's the job. The politician's job is to come to you. So that's why they got to find a way to get to you. They, that's why you see them now going on some of these new media outlets like Joe Rogan spoken to a bunch of presidential candidates and, yeah you know they do go on shows like ellen like you were talking about before because their job is they've got to try to reach everybody yeah and that's why yeah. you see them oftentimes in in interesting scenarios you see them you know whatever it might be some a, a candidate who's not gay but he sports gay rights so he's marching in a gay pride parade or whatever it might be yeah that's their job to come to you it shouldn't be that you have to search them out but you know if somebody's inclined to try to learn more ab about these candidates and search them out you could first and foremost just follow a bunch of news sites because you'll learn more that way and also just go to if, if you want like the crash course type thing i just recommend people go to on the issues.com you know on the issues is it'll tell you where a po somebody who's already a politician like if you want to know where they stand on stuff yeah. there's like very simple breakdowns that are out there where you can see exactly what their policy positions are nice okay um do you think that the media like purposely goes out of their way to try to like not mention Bernie's rallies or like put him like have coverage of Bernie? Okay, that's a good question. And here's the way it works. Here's the way I think it works. First and foremost, it's not I wouldn't call it like a nefarious conspiracy. It's not like all these people at all these networks get in a smoke filled back room and they're like <laughs> We shall now exclude these candidates that are anti-establishment. ha. <laughs> That's not the way it works. The way it works was described much better by Noam Chomsky in Manufacturing Consent. And this book is really old now, but the same dynamics still apply. Basically, the way it works is you only have like six companies that control all the information, all the news and information. OK. Mm -hmm. And what happens is there's a, a, a filtering process where, you know, only certain kinds of people get hired in the first place to work at these outlets. And those people are more or less not going to rock the boat, not going to question too much, and they'll color within the lines. Mm -hmm. So they set up the parameters of the debate, which is called the Overton window. And the idea is, hey, you can go as far right as this and you can go as far left as this, but you can't go outside of that. And so as a result of that, all the people who are hired by these media outlets – just ha happen to have the view that, well, Bernie Sanders is not a serious candidate. He's a fringe candidate. You know, oh, Tulsi Gabbard, she's not a serious candidate. She's a fringe candidate. Andrew Yang, Andrew Yang, he's not a serious candidate. He's a fringe candidate. Who are the real serious candidates? Well, the ones that everybody around me are telling me is serious 24-7, so Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. 
those are the only serious candidates. And so it's this mindset that the people in these elite circles have. It's not nefarious. It's not conspiratorial. It's that they only got hired because they're willing to color within the lines and because they're willing to say, hey, here are the serious candidates. Here are the unserious candidates. So as a result of that, that's why you get like Andrew Yang when he does well in a poll. It's not even listed on the screen. They'll like take somebody who's polling less like Beto and put him on the screen and get rid of Andrew Yang. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When it comes to Bernie, they'll cover him in the most like smug, condescending way possible mm -hmm. where like they act like he's some sort of extremist when all the guy wants to do is like get people health care and fix the system. Yep. And so, you know, that that's the general breakdown of how that works. It's not nefarious. It's not conspiratorial. It's just those those are the people who are hired in those circles those people only believe what the like lazy assumptions are about the political process and that includes the fact that these far left candidates are not serious yeah and do you think that that's a byproduct of like do you think that these people on air like do you think they start off like that with just like um maybe biases towards a certain candidate or like they just sell out to like these media channels yeah, and no, they're, have to conform they're hired because they already think that way mm -hmm. so so someone like uh like yeah that's what i'm saying but like someone like um who's rachel maddow like people mm -hmm. think she's like a you right but then like it, she's so far from it yeah, so that's right. and and i feel like and it happens and you're i'm seeing it more and more is like she might have started out authentic and like maybe gave some raw, you know, um, like, uh, I don't know, conversations with people. But then as time goes on, she becomes more and more corporate. And I'm starting to see it with like Bill Maher, too. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, he's such a good example. It's yeah. just like it's you become more fake as you are in this fake Hollywood world of like these CNN, Fox News, all these channels. Well, yeah, Adam Johnson calls this edgy without being subversive. Mm -hmm. So in other words, what that means is like. You can be edgy, but the way in which you're edgy is never really questioning the way the system works and questioning the people in power. It's always like punching down. Yeah. Like, oh, you want to be edgy? Here's like an anti-transgender joke. Yeah. And it's but like, it's also you're edgy. It's also like what I say is the final say, and you don't see ever anybody on like um, TV like be like, you know what, you're right. And, like, I, I thought about that differently. Like, Megan McCain, what she says goes. And it's just like, she, you know, if someone goes on the air and tries to defend their side of something, which is right, she'll just be like, well, no, I'm the one on TV here, so you're absolutely wrong. I feel like yeah. you get that with a lot of media people. Well, Megan McCain's an interesting case because she's like, a, she just is such a good example of everything that's wrong in the system. Mm -hmm. You know? She's a so joke. She's she's failed up her whole life. Yeah. She never failed down. She failed up. <laughs> yeah. And, like... She is coasting solely off the name recognition of her daddy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's it. And so, you know, yeah, she's a, uh, but for her, it's just, there's so much we could say about her. Yeah. Total emotional immaturity, you know, yeah. being coddled her whole life. Yeah, she's loving the sound of her own voice. Like, it's there's tough just so watching much her. that goes into her, you know, delusional, what's it, delusions of grandeur. Yeah, that's what she has. Like, yeah. She thinks she's so oh. wonderful, and even when she hasn't said anything remotely intelligent in like 13 years. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I bring up like the Bernie, like trying to avoid him questions because like something I've started to notice a lot now, like after the debates or like if I just pop on any, any news station, they'll be talking and it, and it's just like, it, like Bernie Sanders slips out of their mouth when they either like Joe Biden did it. He said, well, my, my, the president right here, you know, like I think people know that he's the guy. It's just, they don't want to admit it. They don't want to come out and say it. So like all these news stations are trying so hard not to say his name that they keep saying his name you know i think um i think they've like deluded themselves into thinking he's not the guy i think they really think he's like there's no way oh he's really gonna be bernie yeah that's what i think i don't think they're like they think like oh my god he's the guy and it's so overwhelming and he's the favorite so let's avoid him i think it's more of like let's be serious he's only visiting here for a second and with these high poll numbers and he'll taper off because he's not serious i think that's what it is which is such a joke, man, because, I mean, like, not to, like, shit on Joe Biden. He's probably a nice guy or whatnot. But, like, he's not he's not capable of being our president. You see that in his answers and just the way he thinks and, like, he can't form a con coherent thought. Like, it's just, like, he doesn't take any criticism. Like, it, there's so much defending of him, whereas it's so easy to defend him. Whereas if Bernie does something wrong or, like, does something good, 
he doesn't get any much attention as like Biden does. Yeah, you know, it's actually gotten sad to watch Biden now because yeah. the thing is, like, when he talks, he's not saying anything at all. No. Like, he's saying nothing, but he still finds a way to talk in, like, this really arrogant way. Mm -hmm. And it's like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you're... Like that thing when he during the debate when he what what did he say that was so oh record players yeah was, we got to teach <laughs> record, them words record players and the kids need to hear words he yeah. was asked about slavery and race and then he goes off on this tangent <sighs> and then next thing you know he's talking about like you know you got to make sure that the keep the record player on a record player on at night the TV make sure the kids hear words <laughs> and it's just like oh my god. And if you go back and listen to his tone the entire time he's talking, mm -hmm. I'm not kidding. At the end of that answer, he thought he nailed it. <laughs> he, like, stuck the landing like he's a gymnast oh. where he, he was like – they were like, time's up. And he was like, no, time's not up. I'm going to go double time just like everybody else around me does. And yeah. he kept talking. He started talking about Venezuela randomly. And then by the very end of it, he act, he had this look on his face like, like he nailed it and no. like he was – he was angry, and he was a rebel with a cause. Like he was angry for the for a good reason. Yeah. But it, you go back and you watch it, and it is nothing but incoherent babble. It's really embarrassing. But I've never seen so much right after the bait, so much attacking of the guy Julian Castro or whatever his name is, mm -hmm. because he said that comment of like, "Do you even remember what you just said?" Like, someone pointed it out on Twitter that was just like, "If you think that shit is bad, wait till you get Trump." Wait till you get like. Like, I see all these news stations were like, well, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on a second. We went back, and he was actually correct. So, Castro was wrong. Are you kidding no, me? Julian Castro was correct. I know, but that's what I'm saying. Like, there was so much defending of Biden, and there was so much, like, he's going to tank. He's going to tank. He's going to tank. I can't believe he attacked him. the problem him. with civility politics and with politeness politics. It's like, if all you do is tone police, mm -hmm. like, what everybody's saying, like, oh, my God, you sounded a little too angry. What you're doing is you're not acknowledging the substance of what's being said. Mm -hmm. And people, I think people inherently know that that's bullshit. And that's so. why you get somebody like Trump beating Hillary mm -hmm. is because people tried to, all they did with Trump during the general election in 2016 was tone police him. Yep. Oh my God, I can't believe what he said. Oh my God, scandal. Oh my God, this. Oh my God, that. Oh my God, he's so unhinged. Oh my God, he's so uncivil. And then he won. Yeah. And it's like people, on some level, people are rejecting this like, tone policing civility policing nonsense and they're like no let's actually talk about real stuff yeah um so i mean people know your take on like the presidential candidates and stuff like that and just to sort of tie a bow on all this um do you think you sort of set a standard of like maybe presidential candidates trying out new media like ha have other candidates been going around to any other shows and testing the waters of new media or, like could you potentially interview some other people as like a you know a, a, a out outfall or whatever the right word is from the Bernie Sanders interview. Um, fallout, you mean? Fallout, yeah, whatever. Fallout boy. Fall, fallout boy. <laughs> <laughs> we both said Fallout boy. Um. So yeah, other candidates, Andrew <coughs> Yang and Tulsi Gabbard, have gone on Joe Rogan's show. Mm -hmm. You do see some candidates. Elizabeth Warren has gone on TYT. So has Tulsi Gabbard. So has Andrew Yang. So there is this movement towards a recognition of what new media is bringing. Mm -hmm. As far as I go, no, I don't. I don't know if I'm gonna really open that door. I made an exception for America's dad because he's America's dad. But did you have any? Did you did you want to call him? Did you want to call him dad at any point? That would have been epic. That was one of the comments. One oh. of the comments was like, I could have sworn he was gonna say America's dad. That would have been amazing. <laughs> yeah, that actually didn't occur to me. I just said Senator Sanders after yeah. the interview. I thought about, well, what if I had said America's dad? Yeah. I think there would have been an awkward moment. So I yeah. had to say to Bernie like. We have a nickname for you on this show. Do you know what it is? And he would have been like, "No." Yeah. I'd have been like, "It's America's dad." He would have been like, "Okay." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like he, yeah, he would have vibed with it, but you, like, you don't want to take that precious time to have to explain that to him when there's actual shit to get to. Yeah, and I don't think he would have vibed with it. He would have been like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a couple times where, I, like, I got nervous. Where you like, Bernie, you there? And it yeah, was like yeah, quiet. Yeah, it's because we had, you know, what people didn't realize is that as soon as, like. As soon as we stopped the interview, I looked at the thing and it said poor connection. So oh. towards the end, we were getting a poor connection and he was struggling to hear me. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. But um, anyway, the answer was no. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm going to open that door to more uh, interviews like that because 
it's a pain in the ass to be honest with you. I mean, in the case of Bernie, it was okay because, you know, but it, again, I got 13 minutes. I would have preferred 30 minutes and or more. And um, yeah, that's just a whole new ball game. That's a whole new thing. And there's a lot that goes into that. And, um, you know, once you open that door, then, then, then the logical question becomes, well, why not uh, Senate candidates? And then why not congressional candidates? Yeah. And the next thing you know, it's like, I'm getting hit up by a, got somebody running for dog catcher in Indiana who wants to be on the show. <laughs> and it's like, you know what? Fuck off. <laughs> I'm not interested. I will say, and I have a feeling that, like, once Bernie gets, you know, his throat healthy, rests a little bit, and does a little bit more of the campaign trail, he's going to see, you know, feedback from that or hear of something or other, and he's going to ask for a, a longer sit down with you where you can get more, you know, out of it. And I think that would be the only way for you to do another interview is because, like, you can maybe punch out some more questions that you had written down for him. Yeah, although I did um, kind of bust my nut on saying what I was already going to ask him next. You know what I mean? Like, that video's already out there. Like, here are the other things I was going to ask him. <laughs> yeah, but but you haven't heard his answer on it, you know? That's true. And That's I'm true. sure, he like, stuff... Care. Yeah, he wouldn't care, and I'm sure there's other stuff that will come up, like that guy committing suicide. Like, even just asking a, like, a question of just, like, how did you feel when that guy said that? You know, just like seeing their like emotions, like how Biden answered a couple questions and like you could see his temperament getting like hot and he was like getting aggressive. It was just like he was this is this dude sitting down at a debate where, you know, a like serious, like controversial question is coming. What happens when you get caught off guard like somewhere else? You're going to punch somebody in the face or something? Yeah. And, and actually, Jank asked Joe, ask um, uh, Bernie that question. About- oh, did he? How do you feel when, because there was like a famous MSNBC clip where they were like, Bernie makes me like physically sick. Like they were saying these terrible things. And Bernie, w- Bernie was like, yeah, it, you know, it hurts. It hurts. I hate hearing stuff like that. Yeah. So he did, a, you know, he kind of asked that emotional question. Yeah. Not as much my wheelhouse, but there were plenty of other questions I wanted to ask. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I enjoyed the interview a lot, and uh, I think people did too. It's got a lot of views on um, YouTube, so check that out. It's like... I think it's like 250,000, 300,000 now or something and still no, growing. No, I think it's only like 210, but still, that's solid numbers. Yeah, I mean, that's that's beast. And, like, you hope some of those 210, like, change their mind. There's new people coming in there checking it out because there's a lot of substantive questions in there. He gave good answers. So, I mean, you're my boy, and I'm only just telling this, but I think you did a great job asking him questions that people care about and not just some fluffy shit that they ask on – the debate stage because it's it's hard to watch those man thanks man i don't know how many people my interview change but that's mostly because most of my audience supports bernie in the first place um but yeah there was a lot i mean he's he's putting in work man i know that for sure that joe rogan interview he changes a lot of minds yeah to that joe rogan interview because you just read the comments and there were countless things like this guy's a hell of a lot reasonable than i thought he was there you know, mainstream media told me he believes X, Y, and Z, but everything he said here makes perfect sense. Yeah, and even I think he even changed Rogan's mind, too. Rogan, I think, is a fan of his now also. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, thanks for doing this and talking about it and breaking it down a little bit. I appreciate it a lot, and I enjoyed it. So thank you. Now we can get back to just talking about farting and, you know, <laughs> dog shit on Kyle and Corn. <laughs> My pleasure, dude. Appreciate it. All right. Peace out. Hey, Matt.